Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service of worship, the first Sunday in Lent. As we prepare to worship the Lord, let us remember that from the beginning of Lent, we are taking a journey towards the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. And so we're trying to prepare our hearts and minds and focus on the journey that Jesus took as the Bible says he set his face towards Jerusalem. Let us open by singing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you. Christ, our life, we were buried with you and rose to life with you. May we walk today in the newness of life. Lord, you have brought blessings to all of humanity. Bring us to share your concern for the good of all people. May we work together to build up the earthly city with our eyes fixed on a city that lasts forever. Healer of body and soul, cure the sickness of our spirit so that we may grow in holiness through your constant care. Lord God, you who breathe the spirit of life within us, draw out of us the light and life you created. Help us to find our way back to you. Help us to use our lives to reflect your glory and to serve others as your son Jesus did. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I worship you, Almighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace, that is what I long to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God, there is none like you. I come into your court with praise, I bow before your throne. Your presence here gives peace within, and joy I've never give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God, there is none like you, there is none like you, there is none like you. Let us pray as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord. Illuminate our hearts, Lord. Show us yourself and show us who we are so that we may continue to journey together as people who have seen you. Change us, Lord. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 55 Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for He has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and He will have mercy on them and to our God, for He will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. 
The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Amen. Psalm 65 Praise is due to you, O God in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed, you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with your goodness of your home, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation, you are the hope of all the ends of the earth and the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains, you are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the people. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with the showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout out and sing together for joy. Our final scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Let us hear the word of the Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered, because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let them hear. May God bless to us this reading from his word. Zoom meetings are the way many of us have been communicating with each other. Boy, it can be good. But boy, it can be extremely bad. A few months ago I had what can only be entitled the Zoom Bible study from hell. We gathered together one by one coming online and one of our members, the oldest in fact, over 90, decided that she wanted to join us. She connected on her phone but she didn't want any help with setting up the connection. She said she would find herself how to do it. So she came online on time, but her sound was not working and she didn't know which button to press for audio. So it was a comedy of errors which took over a half an hour into the Bible study. And everyone in the Bible study on the Zoom took turns to try to teach her 
in obviously a, as condescending a way as possible how the process worked. Now they tried with sign language, they tried sending her WhatsApp messages, they tried uh, phoning her, which only interrupted her connection to Zoom. And when she had got on again, she had seemed to have forgotten how to connect with video. And after a long time of, of battling, she could hear us sometimes, sometimes she could only hear us indistinctly. She just simply pressed the phone to her ear in video mode. And for the rest of the Bible study, we could only have sight of her shocking gray hair and the side of an earlobe. There's an old philosophical adage, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? We live in an age of communication. We have WhatsApp, we have Zoom, we have Skype, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Messenger, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Reddit, LinkedIn. So let me ask you a question. So much talking going on, but is there any listening? I read recently about a man by the name of William Hury, who's a negotiation expert, an expert in communication. And he was being used to deal with the notoriously difficult then president of Venezuela. And he was asked to be the link to help the government speak to the other parties. They met. And William Urey said that the first words that he spoke to the president were meant to be encouraging. Urey said to him, Well, Mr. President, it looks like you're making progress. And immediately he saw something go on in the face of this president. He was immediately enraged. And he said, What do you mean, progress? Of course, the president thought that Urey was being condescending. And William Murray says that he was tempted to argue back and defend himself, but instead he decided simply to listen. And for a half an hour, he listened, he nodded, he kept good eye contact. And after that half an hour, he says that he saw a moment where the president's shoulders sagged and he sighed. And Yuri says that he thought, that is the sound of a human mind opening to listen. And the first words that he spoke after that were the words, Yuri, what should I do? And William Yuri says that it was at that point that he realized that the president was ready to listen. Are you ready to listen in order to understand? I'd like to take a few moments to try a little exercise with you. It's an exercise in listening. It's not very hard and you may even find that it's kind of fun. So here's what I'd like to invite you to, to try. First, get really comfortable in your seat. Not too comfortable, but if you do get uh, so comfortable that you, you, you do sleep, have a good nap. Okay. Relax and feel at ease. By the way, this is not some amateur hypnosis session. Now close your eyes and notice what you hear. It could be anything from the sound of your dog or cat breathing to your stomach growling. Maybe you hear the hum of the fridge, or maybe you hear the rustling of others around you. Just notice those things, just observe them. Now I'd like you to try something that may be very new to you. Try listening to all those sounds without making any judgments about what you hear. No judgments at all. Nothing positive nor negative. Just be a neutral witness to the sounds. If your stomach's growling or your breathing is loud, just be with that sound and do not think you're disruptive. 
and please accord the same consideration to everyone else who might be making a noise of any sort. Don't make any judgments. Just witness. Just keep your eyes closed and listen intently for the next 15 seconds. End of exercise. Now listening is not always easy, which reminds me of something that uh, Mel Brooks once said, which seems a bit random, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, listen to your broccoli and it will tell you how to eat it. I read once in one of Stephen Covey's books, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, of an interaction between a mother and a teenager. The mother said, come on, honey, tell me how you feel. I know it's hard, but I'll try to understand. The teenager said, I don't know, mom, you'd think it was stupid. Of course I wouldn't. You can tell me, honey, no one cares for you as much as I do. I'm only interested in your welfare. What is making you so unhappy? The teenager says, oh, I don't know. Come on, honey, what is it? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm not very happy at school anymore. What? She said incredulously. What do you mean you don't like school? After all the sacrifices we've made for you in your education, education is the foundation of your future. If you don't apply yourself, you'll end up like your older sister. Get a positive attitude about it. So there's a long pause from the teenager. And then the mother says, Now go ahead, tell me how you feel. And Stephen Covey, summarizing this, says, If you were to summarize in one sentence the single most important principle in the field of interpersonal relations, he said, Seek first to, be, to understand, then to be understood. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. The principle is the key to effective interpersonal communication. And of course, the only way that we can understand is to listen. Now let's turn to the scripture. The key words to understanding this parable are the first words. Let the person who has ears to listen with, listen. Now this sentence is not just a phrase meaning get the point. It provides the key to unlocking the parable's inner meaning. And the point is a simple one. Listening to the words of Jesus is the key. The key attitude of life is the attitude of listening. Now we know that listening is not simply hearing the words of a person. Hearing is simply the act of perceiving sound by the ear. If you heard that, then you heard that. But listening doesn't mean simply hearing the sounds. If you're not hearing impaired, hearing simply happens. Listening, however, is something we can consciously choose to do. It requires concentration through our brain's processes. And to listen in order to process the words and sentences and the other cues. Listening leads to learning. Most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. They're either speaking or preparing to speak. They're filtering everything through their own models, reading their own autobiography into other people's lives. Oh, I know exactly how you feel. I went through exactly the same thing. Let me tell you my experience. 
and they are constantly projecting their own home movings, own home movies, onto other people's behavior instead of listening. And this is also a very important spiritual principle. So, as was his way, Jesus tells a story. Jesus said, chapter 13, verse 3, The sower went out to sow. It is unusual that the central character in the parable is not called the farmer or the laborer, for there's no such person actually who's specifically called the sower. Sowing is one of the many functions of a farmer, but this farmer's almost entire function is sowing. As he was scattering seed, verse 4, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. So the first batch of seed falls on the footpath. Now a footpath is a place where people walk. And this kind of soil is a place whose main task is not receiving seed, but receiving people. And it's unfruitful because its orientation is wrong. It receives the activity of people as its main job. And what happened to the seed? The birds got it. The second soil, Jesus tells us in verse 5, some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Notice that the second soil, the rocky soil, takes up two whole verses. And there's a word that is repeated here. Not, not, not. There was not much earth because they did not have deep earth since they did not have any roots. In more than one sense, one gets the feeling that this is the central text in the parable. Some soil in Palestine was thinly laid across limestone immediately beneath. A rain-like dew, which was characteristic in the area, made the topsoil damp and therefore nutritious. And seed falling into this would immediately come to life. But when the sun rose and cooked the dampness away, the seed and its life were just as immediately burnt and withered. Not much earth means not much depth to grow. Not deep earth means that there's little depth to grow. And that they, they did not have roots means not so much security and not much depth to grow. The third soil, in verse 7, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with them and choked them choked by thorns. Thorns are not very welcoming. They choke them and choked plants don't do very well. And Jesus goes on, he says in verse 8 and 9, still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. There's nothing very compli complicated. There's nothing very complicated about this last soil. The story deliberately leaves out everything that might have been said about the prerequisites of fruitful soil. It doesn't tell us anything about proper irrigation, fertilizers, weeding, and several other practices that go into farming, good farming. Everything is focused on the essential. This seed enters the good soil and grows without encumbrance, without being hindered, without being prevented to grow. There are no complex ingredients for the soil in the story. The verb that Matthew uses here for fruit, for bearing fruit, is the word edido, which is a verb which in the Greek language stresses continued, regular, normal action, normal living. It's about normal life. 
Jesus is saying that the, seed, the soil that regularly lets seed in regularly, regularly gets fruit out. This soil's simple task is giving the seed hospitality, to welcome the seed. Now in each of these cases, each seed bears a different amount of fruit. Some will produce fruit a hundred, sixty or thirty times. When Mark tells this parable, the numbers go up, but sober Matthew, Matthew's numbers go down. Some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty. But both writers mean, wow, imagine if the soil is just right. The numbers themselves are not unrealistic, I'm told, because the average yield of an individual grain in Palestine was 35 seeds. But sometimes you encountered a plant that would yield as many as 60, and in exceptional cases, even 100. So what is Jesus saying in this parable? He says at the end, whoever has ears, let them hear. Everything depends on listening. Like listening to that car pull out. Where Jesus is listened to, everything has been done that a human being can do. The fruit bearing then is something that God does. Trust the words of Jesus. Listening creates a womb for what God wants to do. So this parable doesn't give us a developed technology of the spiritual life. There's no techniques here. Simple listening, giving attention to Jesus. So Matthew is telling us that if we listen to what Jesus says, this will lead to changes in our lives. They won't simply, they won't be some kind of super spiritual changes where we have this increased ability to pray or to fast or to raise the dead. But it's about much more profound changes. When we listen to Jesus, the word of Jesus was, will always make believers care deeply for people. It will always make us move towards the community in which we live. In Mark's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, do, not, do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? And the disciples seem irritated that Jesus is using parables. They ask him why he does it in this way. And so they show themselves as people who are not listening because they want an easy way to understand. They even have the cheek to basically tell Jesus that his way is strange to them. When anyone is listening to the word, well, the first soil and all three other soils are pictures of different types of listeners. I'd like you to listen to this and ask yourself, which one of these soils are you? Soil one is listening that holds nothing. A colleague of mine once stood at the door of the church shaking hands when at a funeral. And when somebody shook his hand at the door, automatically, not listening at all, instead of saying commiserations, he said congratulations. Soil too is holding on to what Jesus says temporarily, just for the moment. Soil three allows distractions to stop the listening process. Now, when we think of these soils, it's not the fourth soil, the best soil, that is the only professing Christian. Both soils three and four are in the church, but only soil four is fruitful. Even soil two may remain in the church inwardly it has dropped out. John Calvin said this, that this parable is primarily concerned with those who seem to be teachable. Are you teachable? A 
I mean, some of you have been in the church for years, for years and years. Your church CV may be very impressive, but are you teachable? I've built this church, but are you teachable? I've been born again for 15 years, but are you teachable? Unless we listen to Jesus and allow his word to take root in us, we cannot bear fruit. The good soil is, in the end is described with simplicity. It is the person listening to Jesus who receives what he has to say. This person bears fruit. Being a fruitful Christian is not complicated. Fruitfulness is not a matter of making spiritual steps or of a difficult discipline or of particular techniques. It's simply a matter of receiving. I'm convinced that a lot of our understanding of our life and of our faith is not based on what Jesus said, but on what we think he said and what we want him to say. Somehow we need to allow Jesus to define us, what he said to lead us, to give us a vision for our life. Remember also that we cannot control what other people hear or understand. That's sometimes quite difficult. We want to be able to control that. What we hear and understand is what we can respond to. And many people think that there should be a uniformity in the way God speaks, as if God speaks exactly the same way to everyone. But that is far from the truth. God speaks differently to each person. What each person hears from God is different. And we need to accept that. And instead of trying to get everyone to conform to our own understanding of the word, we simply need to take responsibility for what we have received, the word we have received. In the end, the sower entrusts the seed to the soil. The sower trusts the soil. And he entrusts it to the God who is able to grow the seed and produce the fruit. Let us pray. Lord, we entrust ourselves to you. Teach us to listen. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I am a city on a hill. I am a light in the darkness. Jesus living in me can change the world I am a city on a hill I am a light in the darkness Jesus living in me can change the world So let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine Let it shine, let my light shine, let my light shine, let my light shine
Jesus who can stand against us. Let your light shine, let your light shine, let your light shine. Let us receive the benediction. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. May God bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen.